All right, guys, today we're going to talk about Forsaken. Sarah, she's back. Hi, Sarah. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't say hi to her. Um, so we're talking about Forsaken today. Not Forsaken Sarah, but Forsaken Jesus on the cross, right? You guys know this, right? And this is something that I was taught when I was younger and something that I taught again when I was older. And then I got it corrected by God and he straightened me out. This is the truth. Repent from that and let's go this way. And so I'm going to give you the two camps uh, of belief for this scripture, right? What it actually means. And you guys can choose for yourself. How's that sound? You like that? You guys excited? Yeah. Yeah. All right, here we go. All right, there are two main camps of belief that the father actually forsaken his son, forsook his son, right? He actually looked away from him and when he's on the cross dying. He said, no, I can't look on this. This is a sin. And so it comes from Habakkuk um, 1.13, which reads, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than we? And so this verse is the main verse that people go after when they say, okay, God had to look away from his son when he's on the cross because he's bearing our, our sin. And so God had to look away from him and said, I can't look on you, I can't be with you right now. Even though Jesus was doing exactly what he want, the Father wanted him to do. Right? He was dying on the cross for our sins. He did not sin at all when he was here on earth. And then all of a sudden, the Father had to look away. That, that, that actually, I don't know. Do you guys ever feel like there's something wrong with that? How can I follow that? I mean, I know it's your word, God, but how can I follow this? And so... Through the ages of being alive, um, I learned what this actually means. And so when, he, when Hab, uh, Habakkuk was talking about, he's a prophet, and he's talking about, why are you letting your people die? Because God told me he's, what he's going to do. He said, you cannot look, you don't look on, on pure, uh, sorry, your eyes are too pure to look, approve of evil, right? So it's not that God cannot look upon it, he said he can't approve it, which is different than can't look on it, right? So God didn't have to look away from his son. That's just one understanding, Okay. Now, I'm going to go on to a little bit more so you guys can get a better understanding of what I'm talking about. So, the, the parallel for in, the, in the poetry of this, um, the, this, of this verse is um, for to look on means to tolerate. Tolerate. Do you tolerate this, God? And he does not tolerate it. He does not look on it with approval. And so, in Mark 15.34, we see Jesus crying out this very statement from the cross. He said, um, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, now we know his agony was, was, was true, right? I mean, to die upon a cross was the most heinous um, way to die. They, they, said, they actually had officials, Roman officials who were trying to outlaw it. They said, this is, too wor- this is too bad, we can't do this anymore. They said, no, we'll continue to do this. Now, so Jesus cried this out. And he's, on the, he's, on the, he's, he's dying, he's on the cross, and he, he's, it's, it's in the ninth hour, which would be, start from three to, to nine, and he's saying, okay, God, why have you forsaken me? Now, there's, there's a reason why I, I feel like God told me there's, this can't be true. One is, did Jesus ever lose faith? Did Jesus ever lose faith? No, thank you. No, he did not. So how can he tell the Father, why have you forsaken me, when God's word said, I will never forsake you? Just think about that for a second. He did not lose faith, so therefore, he could not have lost faith on the cross because God's word says, I will never forsake you. So if that's what he says in his word, which is true, um, Hebrews 13, 5b, for he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So did God go back on his word? Did God say, well, no, no, I just, you know, I, this is too bad. I can't, I can't actually do this anymore. So I'm going to have to go back in my word. I'm going to forsake you right now. Is that what happened? But then why was Jesus crying this? Why did Jesus cry this from the cross? Why have you forsaken me when God's word says I will never forsake you? So there's something that I learned in seminary. Um, rabbis, what Jesus says, right, rabbi? Um, they go about and whenever they want to say a full scripture, a full like, section of chapter, uh, like a solemn, they would only have to say the first line. Make sense? 
So the, the first line would be, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So what we believe, what I believe, is that Jesus was repeating that line back saying, hey, I'm repeating this out to all of you so you guys can know what's going on right now. So if we go back to Psalm 22, it starts with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is Jesus' cry, right? You guys with me? You understand? So he's saying, hey guys, well, let's look back to Psalm 22 and see what it's about. Okay? Psalm 22, remarkably, is about crucifixion. It's about someone who's dying a really terrible death, cries out to God, doesn't hear him, doesn't feel like he's near him, and then he says, no, no, you hear me. Right? It talks about, you know, I'll just read it so you guys can see for yourself. Do you want me to read the whole thing? Yes. Thank you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day and you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. Oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you are our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not dis disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man. I reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag their head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver you. Let him rescue you. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Now, if you guys remember, that's actually from, um, let's see, Mark 15 and also Matthew 27. This is verse 29. Yet you are who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be, be not far from me, for, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. You'll see the parallelism here. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Yet they open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Sound familiar? My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced, listen carefully, they pierced my hands and my feet. Now, this is, this is written approximately 700 years, 700 years before crucifixion was actually invented. Right? They pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Another parallelism. But you, O Lord, are be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen, you answer me. I will tell of your name to the brethren. In the midst of your assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. So just go back to the beginning of that, when he cried out to God. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I, sh I, shall, pay I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. It means don't give up. At the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will worship, worship him before you. The kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who grow down to the dust will bow, bow before him. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive, posterity will serve him. It will, be, it will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and they will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. 
And so if you can see this, it starts out as a, as a cry and ends as a what? As a song, right? He's crying out to God and it ends in a song. And the, God, we're, this, is, this is what's happening here is going to be for the best of humanity, for all those who, people who receive me. Are you guys picking this up? Are you sure? Okay. Because I, I, I hate to when, I, when there's like a, um, when there's a verse that's under contention where you're just like, well, there's two main camps. And one camp is this camp, and this one camp is one I believe. I don't want to push my own camp. You know, you guys can make up your own mind. So I'm hoping that I'm doing a, a good job of presenting both sides. But I know it's biased because <laughs> I used to believe the other side. But I want to say that I do not believe that the father ever, ever looked away from his son. That fellowship, that, that, that bond they had, it was never broken. No sin can break that. Even if he bore all of our sin, he was sinless. He was perfect. He is perfect. And so for him dying for us meant that the father was pleased. Because it actually reads that it pleased the father to crush him. Right? If it pleased him to crush him, you think the father's looking away? No, so I love what Pastor Steve said last week. You know, the Bible says stuff. Right? The Bible says stuff. Now, how do we go about understanding what it's telling us? It's by using good training, not just relying on me, relying on Pastor Reese, relying on anyone else. Good training, Holy Spirit, right? To understand what it means. And so when you have these verses, and there's a lot of them, guys, that have these, these two camps, or three camps, or four camps, of just, I don't believe this, I don't believe this. I want you guys to actually use your training, use Holy Spirit to figure out what is true, right? Can you guys do that? And so can we spend this like last, well, we got a lot of time. Um, we're going to spend just the last few minutes just in prayer, and then I'm going to invite um, An Sir Ansel up, and he's going to um, introduce someone to us. But I want you guys to just right now just pray to God. Ask him, is there something that you have not been believing? Is there something that you have not um, been understanding? Because I know when I was in the, in the hospital, when I was in real bit, really rehabilitation, um, God spoke to me, and he said there was a lot of things that I, I either believed or that I taught that were not correct. And so he corrected those things. And so right now, I just want you guys to, just to go before him and ask him, is there anything that I'm believing right now, Father, that you don't want me to believe? Is there something you want to change in my heart? Can you guys do that? All right. So let me start some prayer. So Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you love us, that you, you look upon us. And for anyone that says that, you know, you cannot look upon sin, I, I say, go to Job 1.6, where Satan comes before and you said, where have you been? And he says, to, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. And you said, have I you considered my son Job, or my servant Job? And he said, the only reason you think he's righteous is because of your rings of protection. And we thank you for those rings of protection right now in us, around, around us right now, and that Holy Spirit is around us right now, that we are sealed by, his, by your Spirit, Father. And that we're being led by him, that Jesus is in us, that you're with us and you'll never forsake us. We believe that, we honor that. May we hold fast to that in, in trying times. May we believe your words to be true. May we worship you in truth and in spirit. In Jesus Christ, in Holy Spirit, Father. Help us to stay right now, Father, to understand what you're speaking to us. Is there something on your heart, Father, that we have believed or have taught that is not correct? We want to come before you now, Father, and repent and say that we're sorry and correct us. We want to be Berean and scour the scriptures and figure out, is what they're saying true? And if it is, we follow it, Father. But if not, may we turn away. You lead us, you guide us. You are our God, there is none other. It's in your holy son's name, Yeshua, Jesus our Christ, that we pray, amen.